Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming to my talk. The outcome is better than I hoped for, so that's pretty good. So um, today I'll be talking about the effects of the GDPR. Maybe just a quick raise of hands. Does anyone know about GDPR? Wow. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, so um, we'll be taking a closer look at what it is, and I'll, at the end I'll try to come up with some steps that you can take. Um, because of the nature of the GDPR, it's pretty hard to come up with some general steps that anyone can follow because it's so specific at points. So my name is Michael. I'm a developer at iText Software. Um, iText is an open source library. It's been around for 17 years now. Um, and being a developer at iText Software um, as an open source company, um, I'm very much interested in open source and licensing. Licensing is a very interesting aspect of um, the open source world, and it's something that I've always been interested in, in legal issues and stuff like that. If you want to follow me, this is my tweet handle. I don't tweet a lot, but um, you never know. <laughs> so maybe first a disclaimer. Um, I'm not a lawyer, as mentioned. I'm a developer. Um, the, 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 my biggest expertise in legal issues is being stopped by a police officer for jaywalking. Um, so don't take my word for anything on this. Um, so if you want to take away some things from this, and if you want to take some action steps, if you want to have questions, I'm, I'm okay with answering them, but if you really want some specifics, um, there are other people who are more certified for this. But this is a general introduction. Um, I hope that everything I say is right, because the GDPR is really open to interpretation at some points. Okay, so let's start. Um, the GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. Um, this is the opening paragraph of the legal text. No worries, this is the most that you'll see of the text. Um, but it's just an easy way to, to get into what the GDPR stands for. So the GDPR is on the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data and on the free movement of such data, repealing a directive. <clears throat> There's a few things in there that we can dissect and zoom in on. The first one that we can dive in on is the regulation. Um, people familiar with EU legislation know that usually uh, the EU sets out some directives. Directives need national implementation. You can compare it to uh, an interface in Java. So the EU would send out the interface and every country would need to implement the interface. Um, this has um, some meaning to the GDPR because GDPR is a regulation, it's not a directive. Um, regulation means that it goes effective now. It doesn't need any national implementation. There's a small side note to make that there are some areas that do need national implementation, like um, one I can think of right now is um, national security, for instance. <clears throat> but in general, it's, it's applicable to everyone in the EU, effective immediate. OK, so moving on, on to the next big keyword of this intro text is a natural person. What defines a natural person according to the GDPR? Um, basically, a uh, natural person is the EU citizen. I assume that most of you here are EU citizens. And so this applies to you. You are protected by the GDPR as a person. Um, the person is also known as a data subject in the GDPR text. Moving on, we see the next important keyword is personal data. Of course, the definition defined there is quite obvious. It's information that relates back to a person, to a data subject. But what really is defined as personal data? How far can you go with personal data? There's the obvious stuff, like name, address, uh, national ID number. And for instance, in Belgium, everyone is assigned a number at birth. It's you're just your date of birth, and whether you're a girl, boy, and uh, how many boys were born, born before you. Um, and this obviously relates back to you. If you have my name, Michael de May, then you know that it relates back to me. If you have my address, you know it's, it relates to me. This is the obvious stuff. This is the stuff that everyone thinks of. The GDPR even defines this stuff as being um, personal data. This is the critical stuff, the, the sensitive data. This is medical records. Um, keeping track um, of all your illnesses over the course of your life, that can be related back to you, even though your name is not really applied to it. DNA, it's basically a fingerprint that relates back to you. Um, this is also personal data as defined by the GDPR. And then there is the less obvious stuff also defined. So this IP address, email addresses, um, tr tracking information like I have a badge at my work, it works with RFID, um, that tracks whether I open a certain door or not when I open it. This is also personal data and it can be traced back to me because it's assigned to my name. 
Um, maybe less obvious is also HR information. Um, your company, for the purposes of performing your job and getting a paycheck, for instance, keeps information about you um, in their systems. Um, stuff that's not on there and it's a bit vague. I've, I've been looking over the internet all over to find whether or not it's been affected by it or not. Is We're all coders here. We all have Git repositories or SVN repositories. And in a, in a commit, in a Git commit, um, an email address is linked to it. I haven't found whether or not that applies to it or not, but I think it does. And that also has some applications um, when you go further down the GDPR, when, you talk, when, you, when we're talking about the rights that a data subject has. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, being an open source company, um, that's quite um, important to us. When we get a pull request from somebody, we're getting personal data from somebody. He's willingly giving us his email address, and we store it just because we need to store it in our Git repo. But that's also something that we store. <clears throat> then we have the other actors, um, and those are indicated by processing of personal data and free movement of such data. Um, the first one is a data controller. Data controller is a company or organization collecting data. It's as simple as that. Basically, anyone here working for a company works for a data controller. They, co they collect information on you. Um, a data controller can also be a website that tracks your movement, that um, keeps like a mailing list available. That's also a data controller. A data processor is a company that processes that data on behalf of the data controller. Think of s companies like um, or tools like uh, Dynamics, uh, CRM uh, instances, marketing tools that, um, based on your browsing behavior on a website, uh, assign a number to you. If the number is high, you're a hot lead. If not, then you're not interesting or interested in the product, at least. So that's a data processor. These are the other two actors that should be careful when implementing the GDPR. So why, the big fuss is mainly about this. Who does the GDPR affect? Um, as the text outlines, it's on the protection of natural persons, natural persons being EU citizens. Um, any company targeting EU, EU citizens, be it for marketing purposes, sales purposes, is affected by this, um, regardless of where the company is located. So it doesn't matter if you're an American company, an African company, if you're targeting EU citizens, then you have to follow or you have to comply to the GDPR rules. Um, the last line is pretty central to the, like, let's say, the, the, the theme of the GDPR. The focus is on the citizen, not on the company. And then the last big part is the director of, a directive of 1995. There used to be uh, implemented in 1995, there was a data directive. Um, it's called the uh, data directive, I think, of 95. <laughs> it's very easy to remember. Um, it was already pretty progressive, and in many ways, the GDPR resembles that directive. but. It has been implemented in 95. It was outdated because in 95 the internet wasn't what it is today. Um, we cannot imagine um, how an internet then looked um, right now. But um, <clears throat> so the GDPR is a replacement of that directive with new technology and new actors in mind because data processors didn't really exist at that time. Think of a Google, of a of Microsoft, etc. Those didn't, didn't really they weren't as big as they were today. And then the last, let's say, big definition of the GDPR, things that define GDPR, is a time frame. It's been, um, let's say, made public at 2016, April 2016, but the enforcement only starts in May 2018. So companies had two years' time to prepare or to set up an action plan to be compliant to the GDPR. Um, and starting from that date, the EU will start enforcing the GDPR. Um, I'm not really sure how they will enforce it. Um, they have one big, let's say, stick behind the door, um, and that is fines. If you Google GDPR, then the first thing you'll see, it's a very hot topic. Um, the first five, six entries that you get back are just ads of consultancy companies, of, of uh, legal companies just trying to make you afraid of the fines. So every time I, I read an article, I read up to X million euros or X percentage of global revenue. And I put X there because that number was constantly increasing depending on where I read the article. At one point, I expected the percentage to go above 100%. So 
So um, technically, this is true. This is in the GDPR text. But um, throughout my, my research, I, I came across like this, this goodwill of the U EU. Um, they will not hand these out willy-nilly, as I say. So as long as you can prove that you're making progress, that you're trying to be compliant, um, the EU will be mild. Of course, I refer back to my disclaimer. This is my opinion. <laughs> this is my interpretation. Don't take this as a truth. Um, but this is my feeling that I have from this. Um, one quote that sticks with me um, from a, an interview with an um, EU Parliament member is um, this one, be the carrot, not the stick. Oh, I like that very lot. So um, the fines, they are there. They are there for the, like, the extreme cases of abuse, of non-compliance. Um, don't be afraid of the fines. Look at the future. Try to move ahead. Um, the fines are there for the people who are really stubborn, for the companies who are really stubborn and don't want to move forward. So now that we've got the basic definition um, out of the way, let's continue with collection of data. There are some rules for collection. Um, they're not limited to these, but um, these are the ones that I think are more important. So you need to state intent. There needs to be a clear goal, etc. cetera. Um, the duration also needs to be as limited as possible um, to ensure that everything can be kept safe and um, secure. The, the next thing is actually the, the bigger one, consent. Um, I think we've all come across a website and we've entered our personal data and then we had to agree to the to terms of agreement and at the bottom there's always a pre-checked field that says, I want to be part of your mailing list. I, I agree to the, to the terms and serv of services. That, that's not allowed anymore. Um, you cannot give your consent without, uh, not explicitly. Um, you have to make the physical act of clicking that button of saying, yes, I agree, to, to give consent. So this is something that we all can change right now in our own web applications. This is something that we can do right now to be compliant. It's, it's a minor change, of course. Management might not like it. Marketing might not like it. But um, it's a very easy change to do. Um, the more important part is, um, without consent, you're not allowed to collect data. Um, and even more important, the consent can be withdrawn at any point in time. So that gives the, the, the EU citizen a lot more power in its relationship to the, co to the companies. Another um, cool aspect, I think, is the, the effect that um, a website or an application cannot deny you access if the data subject doesn't consent. So um, if the, the data is not necessary to operate. Maybe um, let's take a look at Facebook. It's, um, it's a very good example because of just the nature of Facebook of, and what they do. Um, so I tried looking myself up while not being logged in. Um, and this is how it shouldn't be. This is also how it isn't, but this is how it shouldn't be. Like you don't need to be a member of Facebook to see whether or not I am a member if I allow it to be found on public searches. This is how it isn't. So Facebook is doing this correctly. They are showing my results if you look me up um, while not logged in. I, and there are more Michaels, but I blocked out the second one. <laughs> Don't want to leak out information. Um, yeah, but this data is not necessary for the, for the... You don't need the data subject's consent to, to have this functionality in Facebook. If you want to see my wall, if you want to see my friend's walls, then you'll need to um, be a member. That's logical because you need to be a friend of me and of mine and then you need to have my consent etc so this is a correct implementation of the um, GDPR actually it's pretty good okay then this is also um, a very very hot topic and in, in, in when you read about it in online the rights of the data subject the GDPR outlines a few basic rights that you'll think that is very basic to anyone um, but it's Actually, amazing that people are really thrown off by, by a few of these rights. So um, let's take a look at the first one, access. Everyone should be able to freely access their um, data that any company has on them. Um, the GDPR also specifies that, there should, that, that it would be ideal if the, um, the industry would come together to make a readable, usable format, and to agree upon a shared format. But I think we already have those formats uh, in JSON or XML. So um, I think we're safe there. Um, this is, again, 
going back to the Facebook example, um, you can go to facebook.com, you can log in and then ask Facebook to get your um, user data from them and they will provide you with everything they have on you. Um, you can ask them to print it out. I think there was like this um, trolling campaign a few years ago where the people would just ask Facebook to print out their data, but um, yeah, let's not annoy them too much. They're just complying to the rules. Updating, this is another obvious one. Um, all data subjects should be able to update their personal data. Um, this is actually something that companies want, I think. They want to have your most up-to-date um, information. This is something that you want, so this is nothing but benefits for both parties. So this is not an issue. Um, it's, the, it's this one that's providing to be an issue. Deletion. It's not that the, the, the fuss about deletion is not about um, having to delete the, the data. It's about how vague the definition of a data, of personal data really is, that makes it so that companies are hesitant to, to talk about this or talk like really in detail about this. So you should be able to request a deletion of your data. In very, very specific cases, they can deny your request, but it has to do with public interest, the public order and stuff like that. But it's really, really, really rare. Um, grabbing back to my Facebook example, this is something, I don't know how to do it right now, but this is something that they used to have a problem with. If you delete, you use, if you delete your own account on Facebook, it, yeah, you know it's, it's only a flag that's being uh, set that you're inactive. Your account is still um, online, it's still in the databases, um, you're still there. If you make your account if active again, then everything is still there. That's a nice user experience um, feature by Facebook, but it's not really compliant with, with the GDPR. Um, not on this slide is also the fact that you'll need to be, um, you'll need to guarantee to the user, to the data subject, that your um, data has been deleted. It's a bit tricky to give like actual hard proof, um, but you're asked to do it anyway. Um, but this, this has some vague impl implications as well. For instance, let's assume that my brother isn't on Facebook and he was present during, during my wedding, of course. And I upload a photograph of my brother. Um, is that data related to my brother or is it related to me it's, or both of us? What happens if my brother, while not being a member of Facebook, asks to delete that data? Um, Facebook might not know who my brother is by name, but they can... The facial recognition technology is, is far enough to at least know that we're related to some degree, um, because he's in a lot of pictures of mine. Um, how far can the, the request for deletions go? Um, because the data on my brother has been collected. Another vague use case that I haven't been able to find anything on online is... Um, just assume that you've been sending me emails in the context of ITEX, we've been talking licenses, and we come to agreement, you buy our license, you buy our product, and then a few years down the line, um, you quit your job, you change companies, but you ask your previous company to delete all your data, and then you ask us to delete everything we have on you as well. Should I delete my emails? It's, it's a bit tricky. Um, I haven't been able to find anything, anything, uh, everything I Google turns up just to be like this, um, yeah, this complaining of marketeers that they won't be sending out, they won't be able to send out mass emails again, which is, I think, a benefit, but, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, um, as mentioned, the, the, the definition of uh, personal data is so vague at some points, yet at other points it's very specific, it even mentions uh, DNA in the text, so, it's, it, it's a bit of a, a mess sometimes. And that's where all the controversy lies. It's, it's sometimes not well defined and at other times it's well defined and then coupled with the, with the high fines that may or may not be applied to you. That's, yeah, you can see that's a breeding ground for, for yeah, mass hysteria. Um, and this also ties into the right to be forgotten. It's a very nice catchphrase. Um, it sells, let's say, uh, articles. <laughs> Um, as you might remember, um, there were some court cases a few years ago against Google that some people wanted to be um, forgotten. They wanted to have some articles written about them removed 
there was this guy who, ironically, that I'm talking about him now, but um, he wanted to have an article written about him that he couldn't make his down payments on his house, removed from um, Google. And Google had to comply with that. Um, so that's basically the reason why you, at every Google search, you now see this at the bottom. So um, this doesn't mean that anything has been removed. They're just covering themselves um, with a blanket statement. So, action plan. Um, as mentioned, I'm not a lawyer. Um, as you might have guessed by everything that I've said, the um, GDPR is quite vague, it's quite general. Um, an action plan, it's, it's so specific to each company that you'll have to look at your own company and then talk to everyone involved. Um, but here are some guidelines that you can follow, that, we, that you can talk to with your management, with your um, other colleagues, um, whatever. So um, the main takeaway from the, from the GDPR is um, design by privacy. So when we design new applications, we always think about the, the, the stack that we'll be using, um, how much money we'll throw uh, against the project, and etc. cetera. But um, the EU wants us, as a technology industry, to also include privacy into our design processes. Um, that might sound a bit vague, uh, it is. It's up to us to define this, actually. Um, but let's try to come to a general set of um, steps. So first things first, um, talk to your management. <laughs> of course, you, you can't make, as a developer, if you have upper management and, and, and layers of management above you, this is not a decision that you can make. That doesn't mean that you cannot influence the, the, the action process. So talk to your management. Make sure that they are aware of this. They might already be. There might already be a plan of action. And if they're not, um, you're scoring points, both positive and negative. Positive because you're thinking outside of the technology field. You're looking at the legal field. You're trying to save the company a lot of effort, uh, a lot of money, a lot of hassle. Also negative points because you're giving them a lot of work or making them aware that they have a lot of work. So um, take that as it may. But, um, Talk to management first, if you don't have the decision power. Then the next step is list everything that you collect on anyone. Um, like every database that you have, every cookie that you keep, every, um, like every, everything on anyone ever listed. Like what do you capture? Why do you capture it? Is it really necessary to capture that to make your process run? Um, to, to keep your functionality running. Um, where is it stored? How is it stored? What's the security that, I've, that you're using? How long is it stored? Can people delete their data? Can they access it? Like basically just a checklist of everything that you're, be do that you're doing with the data. Um, this is a very arduous task. Um, a lot of effort goes into this task. Um, I know um, we've been doing it ourselves. It's, it's a lot of work and a lot of things You'll find a lot of things, you'll stumble on a lot of things that you won't even have thought of before. Like the, the, the Git repo stuff is something that I only recently thought of, but it's, it's, it's so small, it's so, let's say, stupid, but it's, it's personal data that you're collecting. Um, so collect everything that you have, that you on your own projects, on your own applications. This also includes HR uh, stuff, by the way. Um, like even on DevOps, if you go to a booth and they scan you, that's collecting information, of course. Then the next step, check the tools that you use. Um, like if you work for a bigger company, then you'll have a CRM, you'll have an ERP system. Um, those also have sensitive data, sensitive data being the, the personal data of this, uh, data subjects. Check those. You don't need to make sure that they comply. You don't need to tell them to be compliant. Just know whether they're compliant or not, and then take actions from there. Um, like your marketing tools, are they compliant? Aren't they compliant? Um, that's very important. So these are usually externally developed or hosted. Um, doesn't mean that you're free to just say, I don't care. Um, you have to know whether or not you are compliant. Um, okay. Then. As we all know, recently there have been a lot of data breaches, security breaches. A lot of companies have been hacked, data has been leaked, personal data has been leaked. 
just recently in the US, um, personal data of millions, hundreds of millions of American citizens ha has been leaked, has been hacked. So um, I'm not saying that you can prevent every breach, um, but what you do need to have is a breach policy. Like, what do you do when a breach has been detected? How do you detect breaches? Um, who do you contact? Um, what's the severity of the breach, etc.? cetera? Um, these are all quite, these aren't like technical questions, but these are um, procedural questions. Like, do we have a procedure in place um, to, de to detect breaches? Um, this is a pretty open question, actually. This is not something that I can help you because this is your, um, your own company's implementation. <clears throat> okay, and then measurements. Um, it's a very brief list. Um, I, I know, um, but it's, it's so hard to come up with like real, real, real concrete steps that any developer can take. So um, th the most obvious one is to anonymize your data. Is that If that's possible, do that. Um, if it's not possible, the GDPR text also talks about uh, pseudonymizing your personal data storage. Um, that means that you actually extract the personal data from the functional data that you're using in, 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 the, um, in your application. Um, and the, the user becomes an abstract uh, ID, like a number, uh, a random st uh, ca string of characters. And there is a link between them, but you keep it separate. For instance, you keep the, the actual personal data separate and then the pseudonymized data in, your, in another database or something. And you encrypt the former, but not the latter. But you should encrypt the latter, but you know what I mean. Um, <coughs> encryption is very important, of course. Uh, I hope everyone is already encrypting his data. If not, um, see me after, we'll talk. Um, so yeah, take as many precautions as possible when storing data. Um, of course, you don't need to go too overboard with it, that you're, it's not getting uh, feasible anymore to, to, to work properly with your data. Um, but it should be encrypted. This is something that we should be doing right now. Um, and the last one is um, already implement or prepare, think of ways to, um, to guarantee that data subjects can uh, exercise their rights. These are the rights that I was talking about earlier, like accessing rights, um, updating and deletion. These might not be present in your, um, in your applications, um, but these don't need to be in your application. There just need to be a formal process of, of allowing the, the user to, to exercise his rights. Like there, there should be a formal process that the user can identify himself and then that, you, that he can get his, uh, his data, that he can update his data. Um, if not, then um, you're not being fully compliant, let's say. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I went a bit too fast because of my nerves. I apologize. I, I said everything I had to say, so I'm, I'm very happy with it. So let me just summarize real briefly. So the, the summary is, um, the focus is on the EU citizen, on the data subject. Um, it requires a change of mentality, not only in the developers, but also in the management um, side of things. And basically, um, it boils down to using common sense. When you design an application, look at, just place yourself in the data subject's uh, position, like, um, do I want this company to store my information? Do I, would I like that? Would I, how would I want a company to handle on that information? Just use common sense. The EU is quite, um, at least to my feeling, is, is quite um, liberal on that, and they will try to, if they see that you're trying to be compliant, then they will be happy, I think. Uh, so the intent and actions are the key factor. Um, it's better to do something than to do nothing, um, even if that something doesn't lead to full compliancy. And it's hard to be fully compliant because it's so hard to, to just figure out what the full compliancy is. So um, that's the key factors. Um, so yeah, I, I do apologize for being a bit too quick because of my nerves, but I thank you a lot for being here. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them now or after, after my talk. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, you, sir. Is it um, commit history on Git uh, could be a problem? If there's only the name of the person 
Oh, that's that's my feeling. Uh, I haven't found anything that discusses this topic. So so sorry. The question was, um, I was talking about the Git history stuff, the Git repo, and if the the name or the email address might be an issue. Um, I haven't found anything like sustainable, susta substantial about this on the internet. But um, according to my gut feeling, it's personal data that, that we collect on open source contributors, for instance. So I do think that it is um, personal data that is a affected by this regulation. How to solve that, I don't know yet. Um, it's going to be hard to just go back and edit the, the commit author of every commit to run a filter branch on that. Um, I'm not sure how to tackle that, but um, yeah, that's something to discuss with a lawyer, I'd say. But according to my feeling, it does affect. It's, it is affected by the GPR. Yeah, you, sir. IP addresses. Yeah, um, so the, the text does include, uh, it does mention IP addresses. Um, I didn't write that text. Um, I, I did write my slides, but it's just a combination of the, um, of the stuff. And although it's not a, like a hard link to some people, because IPs can be dynamic, um, but it is included in the text. So um, I'm not sure what you want me to answer about it. So it's, it is personal data, actually. Um, Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, maybe you there. Yeah. So the government. No, no, no. <laughs> True. That. <laughs> so the question was, how does this affect the government? How does this affect the institutions? Uh, of course, there are special exemptions for the government. Um, as you mentioned yourself, um, you cannot ask the 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 tax collecting of, uh, office to just, hey, could you forget my name, please? Uh, I don't want to pay my taxes. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. Um, the, the government and all its agencies, like uh, police enforcement, national security, uh, tax collection, etc., they all have special exemptions. Um, so it's basically the government is exempt from um, collecting, uh, from being compliant to this. Of course, they have their own regulations on how to store it. and what to do with it, but they are except, exempt from the GDPR to a certain extent. Yeah, you, sir. Uh, going back on GitHub, uh, since GitHub is a US company, um, are they under the privacy shield? And so what, how does the privacy shield from the US interact with that? Whew, I'm not familiar with the privacy shield. So it's, it's some sort of regulation from the US that imposes to all companies that collect data on people. And, um, I don't know, because I didn't know what the privacy shield was in detail, so I can't answer that question. But uh, to, to just pull the line a bit further, um, we have a public GitHub repo, and we sync that, uh, the pull request at least, with our internal Git repo, which is the same, just a mirror. We in develop internally first, and then we push to, to GitHub. So uh, for us, um, this is also included in our internal stuff. So it's not only GitHub. Um, but this, this, also rep um, this, this also reflects to, to um, European-based Git repo um, servers. Not only GitHub, because it's based in the US. Yeah, I'll just walk all the way over there. Yeah. You mentioned DNA. Uh, how about the fingerprint? Yeah, so the question was, um, how does, so I mentioned DNA, how does fingerprints relate to that? Um, yeah, fingerprints are also identifiable to a person, so they also fall underneath um, the GDPR. Of course, I only have a limited space on the page. I don't want to bombard everyone with too many terms, too many words. So, um, yeah, fingerprints also fall under uh, the GDPR. Did they also mention positional data? Positional data, like geospatial? Yeah, that's also in there. That's, that's basically um, the bit that I was talking about with the, um, the badge that I have on my work. For my office, that's, you could also consider that um, geospatial information. Um, when I open one door, my company knows that I'm at Office A. If I go down the stairs, I open another door, they know that I'm at Office C, for instance. So that's also geospatial. So yeah, it also falls underneath that. Um, yeah, you, sir. So um, the question is, is it, is it okay to remove the names from medical records? Yeah, and just keep the medical records for like statistics or for like research, for 
yeah, that's that's basically um, part of the pseudonymation of the um, of the data. So, if you can make your data in such a way that it's not traceable back to a person, then it's at least more compliant than doing nothing. Um, but um, to give to be so specific, I don't know. It depends also on the nature of the medical records. Um, sometimes the medical history of a person can be so um, individual that it just traces back to a person, um, given the string of diseases and then a string of operations, you can, you can de deduct. So it's, it's a bit of gray area. So that's the difficulty of the GDPR. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe you in the white shirt first. And Oh, so you collect data, or, or your company or a company collects data on EU citizens, and they sell it to another company, or they send it to another company that sells it? No, no uh, another company uses actually our products in, in the end product they uh, sell to customers. Oh, yeah. That's product that's sold to users our service. Yeah, you all fall under the um, GDPR. Um, you because you collect it, and then the other company because they process it. They process the data from the... No, we also do the processing, but ah, the okay. product that's used, they send data to us, but where do we, does the user has to give the consent because they can't give it Whew. directly to us because they don't really know we have rights. Yeah, so um, I didn't mention it, but um, you also you give consent to, to a company and to its um, processors as well. So um, when I give my, my data to, to a Google, for instance, or another company, um, they also... It also applies further to, to processors of there. So that would be your company, let's say. And then, um, but if I revoke my consent, then company A needs to pass that on to company B. So it's basically a network of uh, consent requests. Is, does that answer your question? Because, uh, yeah. If not, come see me after. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Yeah, you? Yeah, uh, yeah. As I as said, um, it also applies to. It's very similar to HR information. So um, you guys don't know my paycheck information. That's that's good, I think. <laughs> but. But but you're work for a government uh, agency. So. Uh, But the, as, as mentioned before, um, the, the government has special exemptions, and in order to function correctly and without any, um, let's say, real hassle of getting everyone's permission, consent, stuff like that is, is falls under that umbrella of the government is exempt. Uh, so if you work for the government, it's basically exempt. Except, but uh, yeah, there are some edge cases, but I think you fall under the exemption of that. Okay. Um, yeah, you sir. Let me just. So the question was, um, how will the EU check whether or not um, non-EU companies will be compliant? And what can they do against that? And the second question was, um, will that not cause US companies, for instance, to, to reject uh, EU citizens? Um, that, that, those are valid concerns. Those are also concerns that you'll find when you start researching this topic. Um, the first one is, um, you, you, you might have heard it in the news like a few, I think it was months ago, that Google was fined, like a very high fine by the EU. The EU has, has that power to, to enforce that. Don't forget that the EU is a very big market. 
the EU has around has a, f a few hundred million people uh, living here, a very high tech, very let's say well off um, continent that we are. Um, so any e U.S. company that wants to exclude any EU citizen is excluding basically a huge piece of the world, huge piece of the market. Um, just because we are unified in the market makes it makes it very strong for us. We have a very strong argument for for making that point actually. So, um, but sure, um, companies can decide not to serve any EU citizens, um, but they can do that before the EU, uh, before the GDPR as well. They just now have a, like an actual reason to do it, um, but I don't think that will happen. Yeah, you, sir. What about signed contracts between two parties? Because then there are two parties involved. You cannot rest, you delete. Them. No, that will be. Um, I'm not really too sure about that. So the question was, about what about signed contracts? Um, I think it would be counterintuitive to contract law if you could just say, I want my name to be deleted from this contract, because that's a bit counterintuitive to how contracts work. So uh, I'm not a lawyer or anything, but I think that's the... That was also one of my first questions. So, <laughs> the, Okay, yeah, you, sir. Yeah, yeah. So um, the question was: as a developer, as as a support member, am I allowed to see um, customer information in my first line or second line support? Yeah, the, the GDPR doesn't restrict anyone from seeing data. Um, it just enforces companies to to have policies in place to protect uh, the data, to make sure that the data doesn't get leaked, doesn't get um, in public, for instance. Um, and if your company is going to be um, GDPR compliant, you'll notice that they'll start looking into um, DPOs, data protection officers. Those are like, let's say, uh, security consultants. Let's let's use that word. Um, the EU expects around 80,000 new jobs being created for DPOs. So if you're interested in that, that's a nice job opportunity. But um, you can still see everything in your company that you can now. It will just be that there are policies going to be set in place. Um, the breach policies will be set in place. Um, it's just m mainly, aside from the technical si side of things, it's just procedures that need to be set in place, policies that need to be enforced. So I hope nothing will change for your day job, <laughs> but I don't think it will. Okay. Yes, sir. Someone connected to that What about um, using production data for testing. Would that be a problem in one way because it's another use than the user has given the test? That might, that might be a problem, yes. So the question was, um, can I use production data in in testing? What? Yeah, I, well, I'm not fully sure, but I think it is. Yeah. So um, I don't I don't remember if it was on my slides, but if you if the customer if the customer if the user gives his consent, he needs to know to what he gives his consent to. So um, using um, production data in test environments. That might be an issue if if he, if he didn't give consent to it. Um, that's easily fixed, of course. Just ask his uh, consent to that. Yeah, that's also a possibility. Yeah, but, uh, a lot of time data is structured, and from the structure you can still recognize clients. True. Uh, uh, and that's, for example, for developers the biggest issue because they want to have production-like data. They want to. They don't want to know who it is. They are really interested. They want to have. And, and the relationship between the Yeah, yeah, that's actually a very nice issue, um, one that I didn't think of. Uh, so that's pretty nice. So the issue is um, using production data in test environments. That's not allowed unless they consent. But you can anonymize or pseudonymize to an extent so that the data is not recognizable anymore or traceable back to a person. And then you can use that. Because in a development environment, um, yeah, you want to have like actual data, production data to test on. Um, and that way you can, let's say, um, have anonymous data. That's that was your point, right? Yeah. yeah, I think that that's how it should be. It's also a lot easier to ask it. Yeah, I was just going to say that it's a lot easier and a lot cost more more cost effective to just ask consent for for that. 
No, no. No, as mentioned, um, if you have, a, for instance, the medical records that the, the other um, sir just asked, if you just remove the name, you can still trace back to a person based on some key factors in, in the data. So anonymizing is, is good and all, but it's not the, the final ends, the final means to your ends. So um, there's a lot of things that you'll need to talk about with, with your team and with your managers, actually, and your legal team, if you have one. Okay. So, how is the analysis on big data yeah. affected? That's your question? Companies collect a lot of data, right? Mm -hmm. For all your customers. And what you do, you do a lot of cross selling if you can. Mm -hmm. Especially larger customers. Is that still allowed to, to, to profile clients based on, on uh, the information that they give you? Who? Because they give it for one purpose, but you use it for another purpose. That's basically the, the same question as before, right? Just a different context? Okay. No? So um, the previous question was, um, can I use production data in test environments? And your um, so it's basically a, a deflection from your um, consent that you've you've given, you've, you've been received, yeah. and it's basically the same. Now it's just you're using the d big data that you collected and you try to analyze it. Um, I think that's that's let's say easily solved, but by just making sure that you specify correctly what you want to do with the data and that the customer or the user knows what you're trying to do and get consent for that. It's basically transparency. You, we want to be as transparent as possible. The EU wants you to be transparent um, about what you do with data. That's, that's basically my feeling as well, that, that I get from it. No? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Okay, anyone else? Yeah, you, sir. Oh, you, sir, yeah. Uh, are, any, are there any specific time constraints on the data for how long? As long as it's necessary. So the, the question was, are there any, well, it's very flu, but, um, yeah. So the, I'll repeat the question first. So are there any time constraints on collection and storage of data? Yeah. 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 And your remark was? Mm -hmm. You can keep audit log data for yeah. 101 days, but not longer. And, I mean, and there are other numbers, I just don't know. So yeah, I don't know them by heart as well, but um, they, are, they are defined in the text, and it's basically short. It's very short. 